Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this Mr. Pandaria raiding guide. And in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the heroic mode version of Megara in the Throne of Thunder raid. Now in order to complete this fight, you're going to want to bring two tanks, three healers, and then a mixture of both ranged and melee DPS. And I guess if your healers are up for it, which I doubt they will be, you could try two healing it, but it's very highly recommended you take three healers. Now, not much has actually changed in this fight, but enough has changed to classify it as a heroic mode encounter. So first of all, we are going to go over the abilities that have changed in normal mode, and then we'll have a look at what's new in the heroic mode version of the fight. So one of the first big changes is that the Venom Head, which is the, the green one, will now spit three globules of acid at you when he casts his acid bomb ability. Now, that's the massive green circles that get targeted on the ground, and then do raid-wide damage to everyone, except he does this three times for each spit. So, this because this is, like, the worst damaging ability, potentially, we just ignore the green head for the entirety of the fight. And I'll speak about that a little bit later on in the guide. What you need to remember is ignore green, red, blue, and purple, which is something else I will mention later on in the guide, is what's going to be your priorities for this fight. Another change is on the flaming head. The flaming cinders debuff has changed ever so slightly. From now on when a player gets the cinders debuff on them, instead of it just leaving a patch of fire on the floor when it gets dispelled, it will leave a patch of fire on the floor every three seconds based on where that player is currently standing. So you'll want them to move as fast as possible in order to dispel them or you could also use this additional change to your advantage in order to clear away some of the icy paths that are placed from the Torrent of Ice. Those two abilities still work against each other, as they did in the normal mode. So yeah, not much has actually changed from the normal mode version of the fight, it's just those two abilities that have had the major changes. Everything else is still still here, for example, when you kill a head, it will go into the concealing fog, and it will also spit, like, death at you. We'll call it death, because, you know, why call it by its proper name? And you can still, as I've already mentioned, like, counteract abilities with each other. For example, cinders will get rid of the ice path that's left on the floor, and vice versa, the ice path will also get rid of any cinders. So you should bear that in mind, because this fight obviously is a bit longer, and in general, because it's a heroic mode fight, damage will be a lot higher to the raid, and also you will need a higher DPS output in order to meet enraged timers. So, the big change for heroic mode is that you get a fourth head, and this is the arcane head, and he, he pretty much acts like the other three heads. He has his own little set of abilities, and then one ability that's kind of a blanket ability for all three heads. So that ability is called Diffusion, and this is his frontal cone ability that will deal a moderate amount of arcane damage every second for 3 seconds to anyone that's standing within a 45 degree frontal cone of him. So as with the other heads, he needs to be tanked facing away from the raid at all times. Now this debuff will obviously hurt quite a bit, and it will also reduce the healing that received by those players that get hit by it by 10% per stack. So, by the time the head you're currently targeting is dead, tanks should look to have about two stacks of this debuff maximum. Any more, and you might run into a few healing issues, but it shouldn't be too much of a problem as long as you've got correct cooldowns. Now, on top of the diffusion ability, the arcane head has another ability called Nether Worms, and this is where he will spawn a number of little adds throughout the fight, and obviously... The more heads that are back within the concealing fog, the more adds that are going to get spawned. It's it's kind of like a a pain in the arse, really. Actually, that's probably the best way of putting it, because these adds can do quite a bit of damage, and this is what separates this from the normal mode encounter. Now, these nether worms have got two abilities. The first one is called Nether Spike, and this is where it will deal a moderate amount of arcane damage to a player. You can heal through this. However, the nether spike can also be interrupted. It's probably also worth noting that these nether worms can be stunned, silenced, interrupted. So you'll probably want to do that. Like in the video in the background, you can probably see the mage putting down Ring of Frost. 
and if you have warriors you can get them to stun it's just a way of keeping them crowd controlled for as long as possible their second ability is called suppression and this will target a certain player in the raid just any random player and it will stun them for 15 seconds now again just like nether spike this ability can be interrupted and you can also dispel the suppression off the player it's on so obviously you don't want a player to be out of the 5 for 15 seconds you want to have this dispelled as soon as possible if it does get cast on them Now thankfully there is a god and these adds don't actually hit for that much damage so you don't have to do something stupid like bring a third tank. There are two ways of actually doing this fight, uh, well managing the adds anyway. The first way would be to have a, a hunter possibly misdirect the adds to a tank or have one of your tanks pick up the adds. But because the tanks are taking quite a bit of damage in this phase and they can't really move because the heads need to be pointing away from the raid at all times. We had a melee DPS, which in this case was a death knight, use an AoE ability in order to pick up the adds, and then a hunter misdirected the adds to the death knight as well, so that he was keeping aggro on them. They were all in one place on top of each other and could be stunned and AoE down by only two players, and we only assigned the hunter and the death knight to actually killing them, because we wanted everyone else to focus their DPS on the heads in order to obviously get them down as fast as possible. The longer the heads are up, the more adds you're going to have spawning. So it's kind of a, you need to find a compromise between how much DPS you do to the adds and how much DPS you actually do to the heads. So with the addition of this extra head, obviously the amount of damage in the rampage phases is going to go up quite a bit considering there's another head also dealing damage to your raid and subsequent heads that are back in the concealing fog as well. Now the order that we used in order to kill the heads that we found the most effective was to kill the blue one first, then the red one, then the purple one, then the blue one, then the red one, then the purple one, and then as you kill the final blue one that will be the last one that you need to actually kill the boss. So you'll have six rampages in total and you've got to kill seven heads. Now, we used Bloodlust on the second blue head because we found this was the best time in order to nuke off any adds that might still be up, get the head killed, and then move on to the red head as soon as possible. It, it's, it's pretty much you're going to stack up for Rampage, use your Bloodlust, kill the blue head, and then as soon as you're kind of spreading out after the Rampage, you'll be moving in to stack up again for the flaming head. Now, as I've mentioned, there is a fourth head, and Rampage damage is going to be a hell of a lot higher. So, what you want to do is obviously set up a decent form of healing cooldown rotation, and you need to make sure you stick to them as well. And what you also will find is that if your DPS tend to fluctuate, for example, if you've got high DPS on a head on one try and have it on another, cooldowns might not be coming up in time. So that is something to just bear in mind during the fight. So on the first two, we, well, on, on, in this video, we used nothing on the first one. And then on the second one, we used a Priest Barrier and a Druid's Tranquility. Now, these then go on cooldown. The Tranquility is three minutes. I think the Barrier is probably three minutes as well. So they will then be off cooldown for the fifth one. On the third one, we had the Shaman uses Spirit Link Totem, which would then be back off cooldown for the sixth one, which is the final rampage. Which meant that on the first and fourth one, we had to use our own kind of cooldowns that weren't weren't too overkill, I guess the word is. Like, not too powerful, but good enough to actually heal through what's being cast at you. So just as an example, on the first one, I'd probably use Nature's Vigil, which increases my healing by, what is it, 10% for 30 seconds. And then I'd also use that on the fourth one as well. If possible, I'd use it in between there as well, because healing, extra healing on the other heads is better. Also, by using some cooldowns on the earlier heads, such as, uh, sorry, the earlier rampages, such as the first one and the second one, it also means you're kind of saving a bit more mana for later on in the fight, because it does become real healer intensive. So that's the first main issue that you're going to have to deal with in this fight, which is the 
the healing rotations and making sure you're not wiping during the rampages. The second thing that you're also going to have to look out for is your positioning. And this is because you are going to get a lot of ice and fire on the ground at certain points during this fight. And something you should also note, because this is the heroic mode version of the fight, the torrent of ice patches of ice that are on the ground will slowly grow over time. And they will disappear after, I think it's a minute, a minute and a half possibly. But during that time period, they will grow. So, like I say, keep this in mind at all times. Ideally, what you want to be doing, and in kind of an ideal raiding world, in an ideal raiding environment, you want to be trying as much as possible to stack the torrent devices on top of each other where, where you can. Because obviously this gives you a lot more room to move around. And then on top of the ices, you want to be having your cinders debuffs dispelled on top of them because it'll remove the ice and then you can just rinse and repeat that rotation put the ice down put the cinders on top of them then put the ice on top of the cinders then the cinders on top of the ice again it just keeps on nullifying each of the abilities and keeps them in a nice neat positioned place that's in an ideal world on this fight in reality what you're probably going to find is that most of the room is covered in ice and there are random patches of fire here, there and everywhere. So what we did is at all times we made sure that the ranged were at max range of the heads. And if you got the torrent of ice debuff on you, you would just run straight backwards. Not in any stupid lines, just straight backwards as well as you can. And by doing this, it obviously leaves a massive gap between the, the heads themselves and where the ice starts for movement for when you need to position yourself for rampages. Now in the video you can see three markers and these were our positioning marks for the rampages and the colour marker corresponds to the head you're going to kill next. So if you've just killed the blue head, you'd stack on the red marker because you're killing the red head next. If you've just killed the red head, you'll stack on the purple marker because you're going to kill the purple head next. And then if you're going to stack on the blue marker, it's because you've just killed the purple head and you're going to kill the blue head next. It's a fairly simple way of keeping track of what head you're going to kill next and also knowing where you need to be for a rampage. So that's going to do it for this Mr. Pandaria raiding guide. Hopefully it's going to aid you in getting a, a brand new shiny heroic kill. I think we chose to do Megara as number, number 6 or number 7 in our total of kills. We didn't follow the the strict order that the bosses are in because it was easier to go for later bosses earlier on for example we killed like iron quan third or something like that because it's an easy fight so megara is a bit of a later on fight but this is mainly because of the healing requirements that are needed so you might want that bit of extra gear in order to actually go for the boss but as always thank you for watching and if you are interested in future mr pandaria raiding guides then please do feel free to subscribe to the channel